Um, and so servers, again, are run um, over a network. We can make requests over a network. And so how does this sort of tie in with each other? So when we start up a server, that server is assigned IP address. And this IP address is unique to each server. Um, so for example, when we run like our apps on our terminal, we have local code, and that's the type of server. And that distinguishes um, our computer as a server. And yeah, there's different IP addresses for different domains. So um, we can connect to a server by a domain name. And a domain name is just basically a more readable version of um, our IP addresses because we really don't want to type in like a bunch of numbers when we want to go to Google. Like we just want to type in google.com. So um, when we type in like that we want to go to google.com, the domain name is translated into an IP address and then um, that's handled by the DNS resolver, and um, we're sort of just taken to google.com. So there's a very nice graphic that illustrates everything for us. Um, so we have our own computer over here, and let's say we want to go to google.com. Um, we just type in google.com, and then it goes to our DNS resolver, um, and it translates um, that google.com to an IP address. So we find our IP address, and it returns it back to our computer, and then the computer goes to look for that IP address. And that's sort of how the whole process works. Does that kind of make sense to everyone? Okay, very cool. Yeah, this, help, this helps you like understand sort of the Wi-Fi stuff, because I remember like I used to connect to stuff, and it said like DNS, and I was always really confused. But now you know. Um, so, Deployment. So deployment is, again, the process of um, making your uh, app publicly accessible. So um, this is very useful because um, when we run even Docker containers, for example, the process still has to always be running, and at some point it will shut down. But um, like if we have a large app like Facebook, we want it to always be running. Um, we don't want, like, um, Facebook to only be usable when like Zuckerberg has the thing uh, like running on his laptop. We want it to always be running. And uh, along with that, we want it to also be open to receiving requests at all times. And we want it to be publicly accessible so that um, like if I had a developer living in like California, they could um, also access their server. And then lastly, we want hardware to be managed for us and connected to the cloud. And this is super important because um, later we'll talk about different cloud services. And we want, um, like, we don't want our hardware to be managed by us because, for example, right now it's our own laptop. But when we deploy it, um, like, I don't want, let's say, like, Google.com to be, like, all running on this laptop. Like, that's, like, very, like, a lot of pressure for it. Um, like, we want someone else, preferably with, like, more expertise, to handle it, and so um, we can like rent a piece of hardware where our server is going to run, and um, yeah, our cloud service will help us manage it. So this ties into our next slide, where we run a server. So um, when we run a server, this allows us to basically make the applications available in the cloud, so that. Um, um, it's more centralized, essentially. And um, we can also then run our containerized software just like we do locally, but on um, a more like stable platform. And also, um, the server can be managed by someone else with more expertise. So for example, if something went down, um, usually the cloud service is able to bring it back up automatically. And it also has um, different tools to automate security, scaling, and yeah, it's just a lot more useful. So there are a couple of different types of cloud servers or cloud services. Um, you probably heard of some of these, um, but Amazon Web Services is a super big one. Um, DigitalOcean is also very big. It's what we use on app dev. And there's also Azure and Google Cloud. Um, does anyone have any questions about like deployment or how everything made sense so far? Cool. So let's do the deploy the server. Um, let's say we want to access it. So we can access it through something called the Secure Shell Network Protocol, um, also known as 
of each. <laughs> Sorry. And um, basically, um, SSH gives us a secure way to access a computer uh, or a server. And it allows us to like essentially run different commands, like update software or install different packages, and just like see the files that are on our server. So um, when we, for example, have an issue, um, when something goes live in production, um, we can see that easily. So um, this is an example of when we SSH. So um, this is eatery backend, and uh, we can SSH by just doing like SSH um, that by server.pem. And server.pem is something that contains a key. So how SSH works um, is, or one way SSH works is um, you can have something called like a public and private key. Um, and so basically we have our client, which is our local computer, and we're trying to connect to our cloud server, right? That's the server we want to connect to. So to actually connect to that um, server on the cloud, um, the cloud like server has a public key that encrypts this first message, and then um, it returns it back to our local computer. So the server.pem contains a private key, and that private key essentially like decodes that uh, message that is sent to us by the cloud server, and um, if there's success, then we are allowed to successfully connect. And so um, the welcome message is just what happens when you successfully connect to your production or your cloud server. Does that kind of make sense, how the public and private keys work? So it's like 2800 in encryption, but yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this allows us to be more secure because if I gave access to like the whole Cornell population, um, like eatery, that wouldn't be very good. Like they could just update the menu to say it has like ice cream in every night call. But uh, actually that's probably true. Maybe like back in case. But uh, yeah, it just gives us security um, and the public private key is one way that um, we are able to secure our remote server and allows us to authenticate local to remote and remote to local. And also, um, the private key is to automate the login process. And then another way you can actually do it is with username and password. Um, I think like Cornell has a Linux server and you can usually log in through that using username and password. So there's multiple ways um, you can SSH into your server remotely. So um, when we SSH, um, we usually make the command SSH user at server.com and then we're prompted with the server's key and request to connect. And um, if it's like a new sort of host, your computer actually keeps a log of um, like which host you have connected to before. And um, it's, if it's not, it adds it to the known host and it like asks you for, for permission to like actually add it. And yeah, we're authenticated again through the public and private keys and different credentials. And if it's successful, um, you'll see like the welcome message and you're able to view you know, different resources in your remote server. Um, and then the last uh, thing I want to cover in lecture is how do we optimize um, our servers? So uh, this is super useful like for, um, I guess, anything because I actually got asked like this question um, in one of my internships. So, um, so usually uh, you can scale through something called clustering, where it optimizes through it too. So what clustering is, is it has like a group of servers that operate as one system. And so each server has a specific purpose. And so um, this allows us to like perform better because um, it, you'll see in a bit why, but um, it just allows us to be more safe with um, crashes or um, and allows us to scale easy, easily. So essentially, um, let's say we had a server, and the server um, has different sorts of applications. It has a web application, a file storage, and a database. Um, the really dangerous thing about this is that like, if your server goes down, then your entire app goes down, and you can't do anything. Um, and that's not very good. Um, so to prevent like, just your whole app from crashing, 
we can have a separate server for each of our different sort of applications. And so we have a web application server, a file storage server, and a database server. And um, yeah, sort of like all of these different servers operate as our whole app. And this is very nice because let's say like your database went down, at least you can still like access your web application and like see your files. Um, you just have a bit of problems with your database, but um, yeah, it just makes everything a bit um, safer and less dangerous. So again, um, some of the benefits is that you still have backups and crash handling. Um, if one server goes down, at least everything else is up. And so that allows us to be resilient with our data and application. We're also able to manage systems easier. Like we can just go into one um, server for like, the web, one for the file, and one for the database. And you can also scale easier and do something called load balancing. Um, and so next we'll talk about load balancing. So load balancing is basically um, one way you can scale. And so um, let's say you had an app with like millions of requests. Um, servers, like, where like each app has its like capacity, like it can't handle too much stuff, like too much um, traffic. And so we can spin up like multiple servers for each app. Um, and the load balancer allows us to distribute the um, traffic across each one. So here we can like split, let's say we have like six, yeah, maybe like 50, and um, we can do like 20 on this one and 20 on this one, 20 on this one. So it makes everything sort of a lot nicer and allows us to handle everything um, a lot easier and we can handle a lot more. And so let's say we have network traffic, you can just like, like allocate it to each um, web app. And let's say we have like a lot of network traffic. So um, when we have multiple, like for I guess like millions and millions of like requests being made, we can actually just like spin up even more servers, and oh, and um, we can continue like distributing the traffic across each one. And this is usually how like very large apps are um, like handled. And so, like for example, if one server goes down, where like if you have a lot on one, they'll allocate like traffic to another one. Um, so yeah, this is very useful to understand because usually if you work somewhere, uh, this is how their um, servers and how their app is handled on one app star level. Um, so yeah, that's it for lecture today. Does anyone have any final questions about deployment? Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I apologize for the technical issues there, but we will get started. So um, just as a qu quick recap of containerization, I'm going to quickly just go over um, the steps to containerize this um, app that I've made. Uh, this is the same code as uh, demo four, like last time, and I will be quickly containerizing that. So in the meantime, if you'd like to set up the Google Cloud stuff, you're free to do that. Um, otherwise, if you haven't done this yet, it's also part of your assignment, so you can just follow along. So let's make a Docker file. Let's um, have our Python 3.7 image. Let's create our directory user.app. Let's set the working directory to be user.app as well. Let's copy everything we have in our current directory. We'll pip install. and we will run python app.py. And then the docker compose file, right? We're gonna have our version to be three and our services to be, I'm gonna call this demo. Uh, let's make the image demo six uh, and ports will be 5,000 to 5,000. So this is the same thing as last lecture. Um, again, what we're doing here is we're telling the computer how to get started with running our app. And then we're telling here um, what images to run and how in like containers. 
Okay. So the thing that you may not have seen and is new, going to be new this week, is to create a Docker uh, ignore file. So Kate actually included this in the last demo, but it wasn't part of your assignment. So in case you missed it, you can Docker ignore, make a, a file called Docker ignore. And what this does is when it sees a file that's listed within Docker ignore, it won't actually push it to Docker. So the reason why this is important is because like we've grilled you about for this entire semester, we don't wanna be including our virtual environments in anything that we submit or anything that we push onto our computer or onto the cloud. We don't want our PyCache, right? And we don't want our DB file. So I'll be including that in the Docker ignore file so that it doesn't actually get post, uh, pushed to Docker as an image. Now, let's go back to my very messed up ZSH terminal and docker build. Oops, I need to change my source folder. Docker build dash T, Najima demo six, and we'll tag it with the version 1.0.0. So hopefully all this is pretty familiar to you except for the docker ignore stuff. Um, but yeah, so let's do that. <clears throat> cool. So I should wrap up pretty soon. <clears throat> okay, then we can push this to Docker Hub by doing Docker push and then the name of our our image. Okay, so while we wait for this to happen, let's get started with the um, actual crux of our demo. So the deployment part. So again, this is the page I was uh, referring to. And if you'd like, you can start your free trial by clicking on this link. I'm already signed in. Um, but uh, you can start your free trial by just clicking on this button right here. Okay, so apparently I'm not signed in. Oh, I am signed in, go to console. So yeah. Um, is anyone trying to get this set up or can I move on? Show of hands if anyone's trying to set up. Okay, we're good. Cool, okay. So before we get started with the demo for today, again, the whole point of deployment is to make it so that everyone in the entire world can access our apps, right? So this URL right here, oops, that's not zooming in on the URL. Um, this URL right here, which says 34, I don't know if you can see it. Um, let me type it into my terminal. That URL right there, you can actually all go on your computers and your phones and look at the tasks that I've uh, made on my to-do file. So this is what we'll be doing for today's demo and on Wednesday's demo. We'll be making it so that our apps are all publicly accessible to the web. Um, <clears throat> Cool, and this is amazing, right? Because you know we can get our computers to connect to it. We can get our mom's computers to connect to it. We can get our phones to connect to it. We can get our TI Inspires to connect to it. We can get our Bluetooth Blueberries to connect to it. Our Nokia phones, whatever um, that has access to the internet can connect to it and it'll see the exact same thing. Also, if this isn't exactly what you see, um, it might be because I have an extension called JSON Viewer, um, which is gonna be pretty nice for um, seeing anything on the web. So if you're on Google Chrome, I highly recommend you download that. Okay, so let's get started. This is the landing screen that we see um, on Google Cloud. Um, I was practicing earlier, but we can get a new project started by just clicking on the project button or this, it'll say new project here. And then you can click on new project right here. Um, let's call it, call it demo six. And this will say cornell.edu for all of you. Um, my Cornell account was being kind of weird. So I'm using my personal account, but this location and organization will both say cornell.edu for um, all of you. So let's create a new project. <clears throat> and click on this. We are now in our newly created project. Awesome. 
So now the next thing we have to do is create a virtual machine. And the reason why we do this is because, uh, as you all know, we need some sort of machine running our app. A server is just another one of those computers, another one of those machines. Um, so we have to rent a, a, a server from Google. And the way we do that is by scrolling down and hovering over Compute Engine. And under Virtual Machines, we can uh, borrow a Virtual Machine instance. So let's click on that. And when we click on this, it'll tell us to enable this API. Um, you can just go ahead and click Enable here. This will allow us to um, create a new virtual machine. Um, and there'll be a bit of waiting here and there. <clears throat> okay, um, while we wait, does anyone have any clarifying questions about deployment in general? Does, is it clear what it is, why we do it? Um, I hope it is, or containerization. <clears throat> okay, let's see if there's anything I can do. Okay, awesome. It just finished, finally. Okay, so now I think we should be able to click on Compute Engine, VM Instances, and voila. Now we're given a, a list of vir uh, virtual machine instances that we have. Obviously, we don't have one because we haven't created one yet, but we will go ahead and create an instance. So let's do that. And we'll call this instance um, the name of the machine we want to, uh, well, we can call it whatever we want. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and call it demo six as well. Uh, demo six dash VM for virtual machine. And we can change the region as well of where it's gonna be hosted. Um, generally, I think it's just a nice practice to choose a location that's close to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose, I think Toronto's closer to us than Montreal. But yeah, uh, US East, Northeast. And we will uh, make a general purpose per, uh, virtual machine. You don't particularly have to know what that means. Um, and yeah, also here, like this stuff isn't too important. I guess the one thing that's important here to note is that each of these computers come at a different price and some computers are more powerful than others. Um, obviously our apps are very, very low, you know, it's not very heavy lifting. So we can just choose, I'm just gonna be safe and choose a small version. Um, you should have plenty of funds to have this running for like literally months with your $300 of Google Cloud credit that you'll receive later. Um, so you don't have to worry about it too much. If you wanna up it, you can. Um, we can ignore a lot of this stuff. The boot disk is pretty important. So this is what we'll be changing this soon. Um, the boot disk basically tells uh, you what machine is gonna be running, uh, you know, like what operating system is gonna be running. So we'll change this from Debian and we'll choose Ubuntu. And all this is fine. Yeah, we'll just be using an Ubuntu machine because um, it's one of the more commonly used machines in both industry and in our app, uh, in our organization. And the last thing we'll change is, uh, is this firewall. So the firewall basically tells you um, what traffic do I actually accept, right? So if I make an HTTP request to my server, I want to be able to access it. By default, it lets you not access it, you know, in case of like malicious attacks. But for the purpose of our class, we're just gonna be allowing all HTTP traffic, and you can just do that by ticking this um, checkbox right here. So that's all we have to do. Let's create this virtual machine. And the way we can verify that this virtual machine was successfully created is just when a check, back, uh, check mark shows up right here. So 
yeah, now we've successfully rented a computer from Google. Let's go. We've hacked into Google. Uh -huh. um, and <clears throat> wait for that to boot up. Awesome. Okay. Now we actually want to be using this computer, right? We actually want to run our apps on this computer. And the way we access our uh, computer is like Kate mentioned in lecture, is to SSH into it. So generally you'd have to use a bunch of terminal commands and make like the secrets thing and whatever. Um, but for the sake of this course, we're gonna make it simple. Uh, we chose Google Cloud for you know partially this reason as well. And you can just click on this SSH button right here. So this will take you to the terminal of your newly borrowed computer, which is super cool. So, so what this means is that you've uh, you've basically given yourself access to a different machine um, that isn't actually on your computer. So I can do ls list, right, to list everything in this directory and there'll be nothing there. Um, this is an entirely different computer, again, from our own computers. Uh, so hence the name virtual machine. So hopefully you guys keep that in mind. Okay, so. How do we actually get our app.py to be running on this newly borrowed computer of ours? Well, again, Docker is extremely, extremely useful in our scenario because um, Docker allows us to just simply run Docker Compose up to run an app as opposed to having to uh, you know, pip install and Python app.py and whatever. So we have to install Docker. So the way we do that is kind of tedious. Um, on our textbook, there's two links over here and you can click on both of them and there'll just be a bunch of commands uh, to run to install Docker. So um, step one is the only step you're gonna have to follow for both of them. The rest is optional. So let's just do that. So since I don't think a lot of you are doing this live, I'm just gonna, oops, speed through this. That. Oh, so this is not something you should be seeing. <laughs> um, okay, and for you'll have like a few confirmation messages. You can just hit yes for all of these. So let's run each of these. Okay, and then yeah, um, so you can probably tell that a lot of deployment is gonna just be following steps that you know um, how to do. Uh, there's actually a way to automate a lot of this and we won't be covering that in lecture, but you can already start seeing how kind of tedious this gets when you want to be running multiple apps. Um, but for the sake of just introducing deployment to you guys, we'll be running all these commands. Okay, now if we type Docker, you can see that we have successfully installed Docker because it doesn't tell us, hey, I don't understand this command. Um, nice. So now let's download Docker Compose. And this shouldn't take particularly that long either. Amazing. So we have Docker Compose and Docker successfully installed. Okay. Now that we have Docker and Docker Compose installed, um, we can create a Docker Compose.yaml file in our root directory. So that's going to look identical to the one we created here because the way we want to be running our app isn't going to be any different on any other computer, right? So the way we can do this is just copy everything we have in here. And then we go to our, our terminal of our new computer and we type vim and then the name of the file. So vim is actually a text editor. You've probably all been using either Atom or VS Code, um, but vim is a 
in term, uh, it was like a built-in text editor within your terminal. And the way Vim, the syntax of Vim works is if you do Vim and then a file name, you will newly create that file name if it doesn't exist. But if it does exist, you'll just edit an existing um, file of that name. So I'll just create a new file called docker-compose.yaml. And now I've created a new docker-compose file and I will be inserting everything that I have in here into it. So the way I can do that is by hitting I for insert. And you can see on the bottom left here that I've entered this insert mode. Again, a lot of this is gonna be pretty uh, memory based. So you're just, you might have to like rewatch this several times to fully understand it, but hopefully that's not gonna be too um, difficult for you guys. Okay, so now I just uh, can, can, can command V like I always would for pasting and I was able to actually face it. The one thing we have to change here is instead of 5,000 to 5,000, um, we want to be changing this um, to 80 to 5,000. And the reason for this is because, again, the first number is the, num uh, the port within your terminal. And the second number is the port within the container. So um, the reason why we're choosing 80 here is because HTTP requests by default all map to port 80. Um, we call how for PAs one through four, you all had to type in localhost colon 5,000. Do we type in google.com colon some number? No, it's overly verbose. We don't wanna be doing that. So we'll just take the default value of HTTP being 80 and map it to the 5,000 within our container. Does that make sense? A few nods? Okay. So this way we don't actually, if you remember my uh, example earlier, we don't have a colon some number, right? So that's because of this. So let's change that to 80 and let's save this. And the way you save it is by hitting escape. And now that the insert thing is gone from the bottom left here, we can type in colon WQ. This is for writing and quitting. Writing is saving and quitting is just quitting out of this file. Amazing. Now, if I do ls, I've successfully made a Docker compose file in this directory. Okay, and then let's see. Now we can do Docker pull, and then the name of the demo that we just uh, pushed to Docker Hub. So let's see if that actually successfully pushed. Did I even look at this? Um, okay, it looks like it pushed. So we can pull, pull that version of um, the Docker image that I created by doing Docker pull as Najima demo six colon version 1.0.0. Oh, okay. Um, the thing that y'all have to note, um, and I'll probably also be forgetting several times is when you run Docker, you're gonna have to type sudo, oops, sudo in front of it. This just means give me all admin privileges to run this command. Um, generally, you know, you wouldn't want to be doing sudo every single time. So there is actually an optional step that you can run potentially tomorrow once we get the Google Cloud credits to allow you to run Docker uh, commands without the sudo word. But for now, I'll just be writing sudo in front of all Docker commands. So let's Docker pull our image that we newly pushed to um, Docker Hub. <laughs> and Awesome, so now we've pulled, successfully pulled our images. Again, we can list all the images we have with Docker images. Oh my God, pseudo Docker images. And we can see that we successfully pulled the image that was in our local computer and now is all of a sudden on our newly rented laptop or computer, sorry, not a laptop, um, Docker images, all right? So we have this one um, that we created on our local computer and is now on this server's computer. Finally, and this is what we'll end on today, um, we can just like, you know, with running our Docker compose file on our local machines, we can run sudo docker compose up dash D. Um, six.
Oh, okay, okay. I haven't tagged it with uh, latest. So, hold on. <clears throat> So Docker tag that's Najima demo six v one point oh point oh and we can tag it with demo six v one or latest. Oh. Okay, now we have the latest tag, and now we should be able to Docker compose. Okay, awesome. Sorry, I'm keeping. I'm going to keep you guys a bit longer. But yeah, now I successfully Docker composed our live instance of our app. So if we do Docker PS, pseudo Docker PS, we have the live instance of our app running. Amazing. Now let's go back to our virtual machine instances. And you can see that we have two IPs here, the internal IP and the external IP. The external IP is the one that everyone on the internet is gonna be accessing. So if we actually hit this and open this up here, right here, you can see that you can also do this, by the way. You can see that we've successfully created um, a live instance of our app on, on the cloud, right? Anyone can access this, which is fantastic. Um, now the front end can use it and, and so on. So hopefully um, that wasn't too rushed. Um, that'll be it for demo for today. We'll carry on on Wednesday. But yeah, that's gonna be how to um, deploy on Google Cloud. Um, any questions before we move on to Kahoot? Did that make sense? <laughs>